Hi, my name is Sergey Levin, and today I'm going to talk about algorithms for unsupervised reinforcement learning. To begin with, let's discuss a little bit about how we can formalize the problem of learning behaviors. First, we need a mathematical formalism for decision making, which we can get from reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, we model an environment and an agent, and the agent interacts with the environment by making decisions, which we call actions. And the environment responds by selecting states and by providing rewards. The agent's goal is to find a policy that we're going to denote as pi of a given s, and it should choose the policy that maximizes the expected total sum of rewards. So its goal is to maximize the rewards, not just now, but for all time. Besides a mathematical formalism, we also need to choose a representation, and a very powerful class of representations is provided to us by the set of deep neural networks. We know that deep neural networks have worked very well in a range of more uh, perception-oriented tasks, like computer vision, translating text, speech recognition, and uh, perhaps it can work very well for learning behaviors. In fact, the basic formalism of reinforcement learning, when combined with deep learning, does work quite well in a number of settings. So I'll show you some of the examples from my own past work to kind of illustrate this point. Here's an experiment that we did at Google a couple of years back. This is a method that we called QTOPT, which is a deep reinforcement learning algorithm for robotic grasping. QTOP was trained in the real world with dozens of robots collecting data in parallel, and it actually works really well. This is basically the state-of-the-art vision-based uh, grasping system that you can build today, and it produces some pretty interesting behaviors. You can pick up objects in cluttered scenes, small objects, big objects, and so on. We can also use deep reinforcement learning to learn tasks for more complex dexterous manipulation skills. So here, an experiment that Henry Zhu ran on getting a robotic hand to open a door. Here is another more recent experiment by my student Anusha Nagabandi, where she trained this robotic hand to twirl two objects simultaneously in the palm with about four hours of real world experience. So deep reinforcement learning, the formalism of RL combined with the representational power of deep networks can in fact perform very well in a range of robotic manipulation skills. It can also work very well in open world settings. This is an experiment conducted by my student Gregory Kahn, where he studied how deep RL could generalize to navigate through novel environments with a ground robot. So this ground robot has a deep neural network that predicts for each potential course of action, whether that action will result in driving on bumpy terrain or in collision. And then it can use this to perform collision-free navigation, avoiding bumpy terrain and so forth. In the world of robotic locomotion, we can also get deep RL to work very well. Here are some experiments conducted by my student Jason Peng on getting a quadrupedal robot called the Lycago to perform a variety of complex uh, locomotion skills, including walking forward and backward, and even doing more agile behaviors, like jumping up and turning rapidly. So the basic principle seems to be sound. However, reinforcement learning is fundamentally a supervised learning paradigm. It's supervised because the reward function confers supervision to the agent to indicate what it should be doing. Let me illustrate why this is problematic with an example. Before I showed this video of a robotic hand learning to open a door, when we obtained this result, we were, of course, quite happy with ourselves, but there's a little bit of an issue. See, to get this robotic hand to successfully open this door, we needed to provide the robot with a reward function. And to do that, we needed to instrument the environment so that the robot could tell whether the door was being opened successfully. So we did what any good engineer would do. We installed a little encoder on a reel of rope that could measure how far open the door is. This allowed us to conduct our experiment, but of course this is not a recipe for general autonomous learning in the real world because most doors in the real world don't have encoders and reels of string. In fact, we could even ask the deeper question, is reinforcement learning actually a good model of behavior learning in general? If we look up the definition of reinforcement learning, this is a wonderful textbook on machine learning by Kevin Murphy, it says that there is a third type of machine learning, known as reinforcement learning, which is somewhat less commonly used. Uh, fair enough. This is a useful for learning how to act or behave when given occasional reward or punishment signals. For example, consider how a baby learns to walk. That's a very interesting example. If we actually consider how a baby learns to walk, I think it's actually very far-fetched to imagine that babies learn to walk through reward and punishment. In fact, if anybody is not learning from reward and punishment, it's probably babies, because babies are actually provided by their parents with everything they need to survive. They don't need to learn how to walk in order to get by in life, because we make their environment as comfortable as it can be. 
So if babies go through all the trouble to learn to walk, they're certainly not doing it due to reward and punishment. In fact, if we actually observe how human children and juvenile animals tend to behave, oftentimes they are not responding directly to reward and punishment. They're acting in a self-supervised, intrinsically motivated manner, like this child playing in the world, setting seemingly arbitrary goals for itself, and then figuring out how to fulfill them. Indeed, to practitioners of machine learning methods, this basic idea will seem very familiar right about now. It's the basic idea behind unsupervised learning, and it has been very successful in other fields of machine learning, especially ones focused on perception and recognition. The basic recipe in utilizing unsupervised or self-supervised learning is that we start off with a large unlabeled data set. We use some sort of unsupervised pre-training procedure to train a large network. Then we get a smaller labeled data set, transfer knowledge from the unsupervised model together with some supervised fine tuning and obtain better performance than we would have if we had just used the small data set by itself. This is the basic recipe behind BERT in NLP and behind self-supervised pre-training in computer vision, and in recent years it has been extremely successful. So the question we could then ask is, can we perform unsupervised reinforcement learning? Can we use the same basic recipe, pre-trained from unsupervised data in the absence of reward, and much like the child playing in the environment, have agents that can acquire a basic understanding of the world before they're actually given any task goal? And we'll, we're going to do this not in simple uh, pristine environments, but ideally in complicated environments where self-supervised reinforcement learning or unsupervised reinforcement learning can provide the agent with a large wealth of possible things to do before any goals are actually provided. Now, of course, we need to select an objective for this agent to optimize and simply maximizing reward is no longer an option because we don't have reward available to us. So we'll need to uh, do a little bit of work to determine what the right objective is. And I'll discuss how to do that in a moment. But at a higher level, the recipe will then be much like with the unsupervised pre-training I discussed before, that we'll have an unsupervised pre-training phase. And then we'll have a supervised fine-tuning phase where a person will come along and provide the agent with some objective. So maybe if the agent practiced different skills in this cluttered kitchen, the uh, person might come home at the end of the day and say, well, now I want you to do the dishes. And the user will communicate that goal to the agent somehow, perhaps through a reward or a command, or simply from selecting from among the tasks that the agent learned during the unsupervised phase, and the agent will then perform the task to the best of its ability. So in today's presentation, I'm going to discuss how we can formulate a principled objective for unsupervised reinforcement learning, how we can derive practical unsupervised deep RL algorithms, how we can turn those into unsupervised meta reinforcement learning algorithms that can actually learn to learn. And lastly, I'm going to discuss a somewhat more speculative research direction that tries to take a different look at an unsupervised RL and maybe challenge some of our assumptions in this area. But let's start with the mathematical foundations. Can we derive an objective for unsupervised reinforcement learning? So the basic setup will be that during the unsupervised pre-training phase, we will select tasks from some task distribution and Part of the algorithm involves choosing this task distribution, and then we'll practice those tasks with our policy. And then during the fine tuning phase, the user will somehow tell us what they want us to do, and our goal will be to do it. The big question that we have to answer is how do we pick the tasks to use during training? What I'm going to describe next is based on some work by Benjamin Eisenbach and Abhishek Gupta in this paper called Unsupervised Meta Learning for Reinforcement Learning, which proposes a mathematical formalism to think about unsupervised RL. As a warm up, let's imagine the case where the user will simply select from among a known distribution of tasks. We're going to denote pi star t as the optimal policy for some task t, and we can define a notion of regret on tasks. So the regret of a policy and a task t will be defined as the difference between the reward obtained by the optimal policy for that task and the reward obtained by the policy pi. We can then define an objective for unsupervised RL in this setting as min minimizing the worst case regret, the regret in expectation under the worst possible testing distribution over tasks. Now, it's pretty straightforward to show that if we know the task space during unsupervised training, meaning that we know the set of all tasks from which the user might select, but we don't know their distribution, then the optimal choice is to train on the uniform distribution over all possible tasks. 
that leaves us with a task distribution and policy that is the least exploitable by an adversarial user, meaning that it minimizes the worst case regret. And this follows from standard information theory and game theory results. Of course, in reality, we don't actually know the task distribution. So we have to do something a little smarter. So in reality, the user won't select from among the tasks uh, that we picked for training. The user might uh, have some other task in mind, and the way that we're going to adapt to it is we'll pick from among the tasks, the task distribution that we trained on, attempt that task, receive the true reward, and somehow refine what we think the task is. So the real question we have to deal with is how to discover the true task quickly and efficiently. This is, of course, an exploration problem, uh, meaning that we need to learn a task space P of T that can efficiently explore the space of actual tasks that the user might select without knowing the user's task set. This might seem like a very daunting problem, but we can actually begin thinking about this using the same kind of regret framework. We'll start with a simplified special case. In this simplified special case, the user will select from among the set of goal-reaching tasks. They can pick any goal, but all of their tasks will consist of delta functions on the terminal state. So there's basically something that they want us to do to the world. It's only dependent on the last state, and we don't know what it is. So SH here determines, denotes the last state reached by our policy, and the user's goal is to have that match some desired G. Now, like before, we can define a notion of regret. We can define regret for a policy pi, our task distribution P of T, and a goal G as the expected value under our task distribution of the difference between the optimal reward for, for that goal and the reward that will actually be obtained by the best policy that we've tried so far. So k here indexes our attempts at the task. So k equals 0 is our first attempt, k equals 1 is our second attempt, and so on. This formulation of regret is a little bit different than what you might be used to from bandits. We're not measuring the reward we've actually obtained. We're measuring the reward that we would obtain if we switched to constantly playing the best policy we've seen so far. So if we find a really good policy, we don't pay a price for them playing a worse policy. We're really just concerned with the exploration problem. How many steps does it take us to find the best possible policy? And on top of this notion of regret, we can, of course, again, define a worst case regret, which is the regret that we would get under the worst possible goal distribution. Now, something to note here is that because the reward is one if you reach the goal and zero otherwise, if everything is deterministic, then the regret is simply the number of attempts that you need until you reach the right goal. Of course, in reality, things are stochastic, so even a very good policy might not reach the goal every time. But let's think about the deterministic case for now, just to make it a little easier to consider. You can think of this visually like, like this. If this is the unknown goal that the user chose, maybe our first attempt goes here, our second attempt goes here, our third attempt goes here, and our fourth attempt actually reaches the goal. So then our regret will be three. Of course, in reality, in very large state spaces, we might never reach the goal perfectly. So then we need to reason about these things in a differential sense or consider goal sets. But nonetheless, the deterministic discrete state formulation still gives us a lot of guidance in thinking about what might be a good objective. So let's think about how we should learn for the special goal reaching case. The first question we might ask is, how long does it take us to actually hit the goal G? How many attempts? If pi t of s of h is the final state distribution for a policy pi t, and pi of s of h is the final state distribution when we marginalize out t, meaning in expectation over our p of t, then we can, de we can derive that the number of attempts needed to hit the goal g is simply 1 over the probability of g being the last state under pi. So if we're exploring the world by sampling from p, p of t and then running the corresponding policy pi, it'll require one over pi of g attempts to reach the goal. And if g is distributed according to some distribution, p of g, then the number of attempts needed is simply the expected value of one over pi of g under that distribution. From this, we can actually derive that if our goal is to pick the policy that minimizes the worst case regret, then the best thing for us to do is to find pi such that it is uniform over p of s of h. That makes a lot of sense. If we don't know which goal will be selected, the best we can do is visit all goals uniformly. Of course, it's not that simple. We're not directly selecting pi. We're selecting pi t and p of t. So our goal is to learn tasks t that cover the states uniformly. 
which means that we want to maximize the entropy of the terminal state. But it's not enough to just learn a few skills that randomly go to all different places, because once we've found the goal, we need to be able to revisit that goal as accurately as possible. Remember that our regret depends on the reward of the best policy we've found so far. So instead of just maximizing the entropy of S of H, we also need to minimize the conditional entropy of S of H given a particular choice of task. Intuitively, we want tasks that individually go to very specific states, but in aggregate, averaged over P of T, visit as many states as possible, as uniformly as possible. So we can write out an objective as the entropy of S of H minus the conditional entropy of S of H given T. In fact, we can show that maximizing this objective with respect to pi and P of T minimizes the worst case regret in this special case. And interestingly, the difference of these two entropies is precisely the mutual information between the terminal states and the tasks. This basic equation will be the foundation of most of the unsupervised reinforcement learning algorithms that I'll discuss in this talk, and it's important to understand what it does. It selects a set of tasks and a policy for achieving those tasks, such that the marginal terminal state distribution has the largest entropy, but the conditional state distribution conditional on a task has the lowest entropy. We want tasks that have high mutual information with terminal states in this goal-reaching special case. Generalizing this to the general case of tasks that are not just goal-reaching is a little bit more involved, but I'll provide a very high-level discussion of this. In the general case, our task is not just to reach some state, but to maximize some reward function, which might involve, for example, avoiding some low reward regions of the state space and seeking out some high reward regions. So our optimal trajectories won't just make a beeline for a particular state, but they might do something more complex. In this case, one of the ways to extend the mathematical framework that I described is to formulate it as matching the optimal trajectory or the optimal trajectory distribution for that task. So we attempt different trajectories, and when we come close to the optimal trajectory, we've solved the task. So we can formalize this as minimizing the time to hit, not a terminal state, but an entire optimal trajectory tau star, in which case the objective we recover maximizes the, the marginal entropy of trajectories and minimizes the conditional entropy of trajectories given the task. So just like before, we were maximizing the mutual information between terminal states and tasks. Now we're maximizing the mutual information between trajectories and tasks. This allows us to extend this framework to the most general case However, in the most general case, it is somewhat pessimistic. It's a worst case bound on the, on the regret, and we can likely do better because in, re in reality, we might observe intermediate rewards before we hit tau star. So this framework assumes that we don't learn anything about the user's intent unless we perfectly perform the task. In reality, the rewards might be a little bit better shaped, so we can probably do better. And second, the reward is likely Markovian, uh, which means that you don't need to match the trajectory perfectly. Matching even some part of that trajectory will give you some reward. So in practice, we can usually get much better empirical results by maximizing mutual information to states rather than entire trajectories. Not terminal states, but all the states seen along the trajectory. And in fact, it's this last objective that we'll use in many of the algorithms that I'll discuss. All right, so to summarize the basic idea behind this mathematical formalism for unsupervised reinforcement learning, we can perform well in the face of worst case tasks by minimizing the worst case regret, which is the expected value of the regret under the worst possible distribution over goals or over optimal trajectories. We can analyze the special case when the user selects a goal and recover an objective where we maximize the mutual information between the terminal state and the tasks we select for unsupervised pre-training. And we can extend this to the general case of trajectories, in which case we get an objective that involves maximizing the mutual information between trajectories and tasks, which in practice is often a little bit too pessimistic, so we will typically use mutual information between states and tasks. Now, of course, there are many caveats that go along with this idea, such as the fact that in reality, achieving the optimal state or the optimal trajectory through random attempts is likely quite intractable, but nonetheless, this basic idea can give us a lot of guidance. There are many potential extensions we could consider. For example, we could consider a setting where we do know something about the tasks the user will select. Maybe we know the distribution of rewards or the distribution of goals, in which case, instead of maximizing entropy, we can match desired distributions, as discussed, for example, in the paper Efficient Exploration by State Marginal Matching. 
And there's, of course, also quite a bit of prior related work on this topic, dealing with things like empowerment, intrinsic motivation, and other similar issues. However, the basic mutual information framework that I discussed so far provides an, perhaps an appealing mathematical way to think about the problem in minimizing the worst case regret in the face of whatever arbitrary test time task we might see. All right, next let's talk a little bit about some actual unsupervised deep RL algorithms that we would imagine using to train real autonomous agents. There are a number of design choices we have to make to instantiate these ideas as practical algorithms. First, we have to choose an objective function, and I talked about three, mutual information between terminal states, mutual information between trajectories, and mutual information between all states along a trajectory at the task. We also have to make a number of algorithm design choices. We have to choose how to approximate the mutual information. In general, it is very hard to approximate in high dimensions for deep RL, but there are many tractable, if somewhat crude, approximate methods we could use. And we have to choose how to represent our tasks. And here there's a kind of spectrum where we, where we can represent the tasks either in a fully grounded way, for example, by setting tasks to be states, very reasonable in goal reaching case, or in a fully latent or abstract way where tasks simply correspond to latent variables and don't have any meaning outside of what the resulting policy actually does. And we will discuss algorithms at both ends of this extreme. Let's start with the left side of that spectrum, goal reaching tasks. When dealing with goal-reaching tasks, as we discussed before, the optimal thing to do is to maximize mutual information between the terminal state and the task, which means that we can select the task representation to simply be the goal. The tasks are directly determined by states that the policy is trying to reach. I'm going to discuss some work by two of my PhD students, Vichy Pong and Ashford Nair, uh, which aims to maximize this kind of mutual information objective and learn goal-reaching policies by unsupervised reinforcement learning. So the setup will be that at test time, the user will command the agent by directly selecting a goal. So the agent doesn't have to guess what the user wants. The user will show the agent the goal. For example, if the agent learned to perform tasks from images, the user will show the agent an image. If it wants the robot to set the table, it will show it a photograph of the table set the way the user wants it, and the robot has to go and do that. During unsupervised training, the agent will have to generate their own goals, essentially by hallucinating images, attempting to reach them, and preparing for the worst case tasks at test time. So we're going to have two models to do this. We're going to have a policy conditioned on a state and a goal, and we're going to have a goal proposer P of G. The goal proposer here corresponds to a generative model. The particular generative model that we will use is a variational autoencoder, although there are many, many other choices. In a variational autoencoder, we model the space of observations denoted here with x as being produced by latent code. So we have a, some uninformative prior on a latent code z, like a unit var variance Gaussian, and a conditional decoder p of x given z. Unsupervised learning will then proceed as follows. We will first generate a goal by sampling a z from the VAE prior and then sampling a goal from the VAE decoder. So this is essentially sampling from p of g. Then we will attempt to reach that goal with our policy. So we'll take actions according to pi of a given s comma g, and we will reach a terminal state, sh, distributed according to p of sh given pi and g. This will give us some data, and we'll use that data to update our goal generator. And the goal generator is simply trained with maximum likelihood. It's basically taking all of the terminal states we've seen and maximizing their likelihood under the VAE by using a variational lower bound. And then we'll update the policy, and we update the policy with RL to maximize its probability of actually reaching the, the goal that was commanded to it. So the reward simply consists of trying to make the terminal state SH as close as possible to the commanded goal. This is a very simple and very reasonable recipe for goal reaching, but it has a little bit of a problem. The problem with this is that when we reach goals with our current policy, we're going to increase the probability of those goals under our goal setter, which means that we'll be setting goals that look a lot like the kind of goals we've been able to reach successfully before. And that's not good enough. That will not get us to actually cover the goal space. Fortunately, there's a small modification to this basic recipe that can make it work very well. So let's imagine that the dots here correspond to states that we've reached in this 2D navigation environment. What we have to do before refitting our goal proposer is to skew this distribution to upweight the rarely visited states. The way that we can do this is simply by weighting them 
by some negative power of their probability under the previous generative model. So the previous generative model, p theta of s, tells us the probability of landing in a state s. If we weight by this probability raised to some negative power, then we'll upweight rarely visited states. And when we refit our goal proposer to these upweighted or skewed states, then we'll propose goals that upweight the tails and therefore visit more diverse states. In fact, we can prove under some mild assumptions that performing this weighting for any negative uh, exponent, basically for any, for any alpha larger than zero, will eventually converge to the uniform distribution over goals. And we can test this in practice. So here we conducted a little experiment where we took a robotic arm and we somewhat suggestively placed it in front of a door. We didn't tell it to open the door. We basically let it figure out on its own what to do. But after about five hours or so, uh, it started randomly opening the door sometimes. And as soon as it started randomly opening the door, then it immediately upweighted those open door images and proposed them much more often, such that after 25 hours, the robot was very consistently opening doors. This is basically the unsupervised training phase. After this, we can put the robot in front of the door and give it some ground truth images to test its ability to open the door at different angles. So in the lower right, you can see the image that we set as the goal, and you can see that the robot consistently opens the door to match the desired image. This means that without any reward function provided during unsupervised pre-training, the robot learned to manipulate the door to any desired angle. And of course, we can think about what the objective of this entire procedure is. We know that this skewing process maximizes the entropy of the goals, making them approach the uniform distribution of convergence. And then what does RL do? Well, the policy is trained to reach the goal G, which means that as the policy gets better, the final state SH gets closer and closer to the goal G. So that means that the probability of G given SH becomes more and more deterministic. If you reach G perfectly, then P of G given SH is just a delta function. So that means that the RL process is actually minimizing the conditional distribution, the entropy of the conditional distribution of the goals given the state, which is precisely the mutual information that we want all along. So this is in fact optimizing a crude approximation of the same mutual information that we previously showed to be the optimal choice for task proposals in the setting. Now, what can we do with these skills once we've learned them? Of course, we can have a user give us an image and attempt to reach that goal. But we can actually also do some pretty interesting things. For instance, if we want to reach some very temporally extended goal, like in this example where this quadrupedal robot needs to walk all around this long corridor, we could use such goal condition policies to automatically select sub-goals to solve more temporally extended tasks. The way we can do this is by leveraging the critic in the RL process. So when we run reinforcement learning, we learn a policy which tells us what action you have to pick to reach a goal G, but we typically also learn a critic. And the critic tells us, will I reach G from state S if I take action A? Usually the critic is just a component of the RL process and it's discarded once the policy is learned. But the fact that the critic gives us this reachability test can allow us to use it inside of a planning algorithm. So what we can do is we want to, if we want to select these sub-goals G1, G2, and G3 is perform a maximization where we maximize the Q value for every sub-goal G1 and every next sub-goal G2. So if we optimize the sum over all the subgoals of Q of GI, AI, GI plus one with respect to the goals and the actions at those subgoals, then we'll actually choose the subgoals that are the most reachable from their predecessor and the most suitable for reaching their descendant. So if our final goal G is fixed, we'll pick the preceding goal GN to be close to G, the preceding goal GN minus one to be close to that and so on and so on. And by doing this, we can actually solve some very temporally extended tasks that just the original goal reaching policy would not be able to solve by itself. So this is some work done by Sarush Nasiriani and Vichy Pong. And here's a video showing this in action for a few different tasks. For the visual manipulation task, you'll see the true task goal in the lower right and the next sub goal selected by the planner in the lower left. The selected sub goal actually corresponds to an image, which is why it's going to be a little blurry. So here, the robot arm starts on the left and the object starts out at the top. The goal is to bring the arm back to its original position, but move the object down. So the robot has to reach for the object, push it down, and then bring the arm back, which is a temporarily extended task. And you can see the sub-goal first proposes moving towards the object, then sliding the object down, and then moving the arm back, which is what the robot does. 
This kind of task is very, very difficult to solve from images with standard goal condition policies, but with the sub-goal planner, we can actually solve it for some very complex manipulation tasks. We can also do the same thing for navigation. So here we have this quadrupedal robot, and you can see the sub-goals indicated by the red dots on the right, and you can see how they, they allow the robot to reach the goal by essentially providing a trail of breadcrumbs all the way to the finish line. Now, what about skills that are not just goal-reaching skills? So, remember how I discussed that there's a spectrum from fully grounded tasks, which are states, to fully abstract tasks, which simply correspond to latent variables. That's what we're going to go with. We're going to instantiate a latent variable Z, and we're going to next try to learn policies conditioned on the state and a latent variable Z. These policies will be more expressive than just goals. So uh, this is some work by uh, Benjamin Eisenbach in a paper called Diversity is All You Need. Intuitively, what we want is for different Zs for the policies to do different things. So maybe policy 0 goes over here, policy 1 goes here, policy 2 goes here, policy 3 goes here, and so forth. Reaching diverse goals is not the same as performing diverse tasks, because not all tasks can be represented as goals. If you would like this quadrupedal robot to reach the green dot while avoiding the red circle, there is no single goal that will do this, but there is some set of states that will allow it to do this. So the intuition is that different skills should visit different state space regions rather than different terminal states. The way that we can train this kind of latent uh, skill policy is by selecting an appropriate choice of reward function. So we're going to train the policy with RL. We always train policies with RL. The only choice we have to make is what the reward will be. And the particular reward that we will pick is one that will reward states that are unlikely for other Zs. So for every skill should go to states that are very likely for its Z and very unlikely for other Zs. The way that we can do this is by representing the reward as a classifier. It's going to be a classifier that tries to predict the Z given the state. And the way that we can train this classifier is as following. We're going to have our usual RL loop where an agent selects actions and the environment responds with states. At the beginning of every episode, we'll sample a Z from the prior. So for example, if we have a discrete set of five skills, we'll sample one among the five uniformly at random. And then we'll have a discriminator that looks at the state that the agent visits and tries to predict the skill that the agent was given at the beginning of that episode that caused it to visit that state. Here's some intuition for why this works. Let's say that we have just two skills, a green skill and a blue skill. Initially, the skills will do pretty random things, so the initial discriminator will draw the decision boundary largely arbitrarily. But once this decision boundary is drawn, then the green skill will be strongly incentivized to go to one side of this decision boundary, and the blue skill will be strongly incentivized to go to the other side. The decision boundary will, will adjust, the skills will adjust further, and eventually the skills will visit very different state space regions. And of course, in reality, we would have a nonlinear deep neural network classifier and a very large number of skills. Here are some examples of tasks learned using this method. Here we're showing the commonly used half cheetah benchmark, which is a 2D planar robot. Again, we didn't give it any ground truth reward function, just used this discriminability objective. And the cheetah on its own learned to run forward, run backward, and even do a really cool flip. For the quadrupedal ant robot, it could learn to walk in different directions. And for simpler tasks like the mountain car, some of the learned skills actually directly correspond to the optimal policy for the task, which involves reaching the hill on the right. And just like before, this procedure actually does optimize a crude approximation of mutual information. So the mutual information between Z and S can be written as the entropy of Z minus the entropy of Z given S. Before we use the opposite decomposition, but we can decompose it into entropies either way. H of Z is maximized because we choose a uniform prior for P of Z, and H of Z given S is minimized by maximizing the log probability of the discriminator. This corresponds to a bound in the mutual information. The mutual information can be made larger than this by choosing a non-uniform prior, but nonetheless, this is optimizing an approximation, specifically a bound. More recently, uh, in some work uh, uh, by Archit Sharma, this basic idea has been extended to incorporate dynamics in a pretty clever way. So this is some work that we uh, published in ICLR this year called Dynamics Aware Unsupervised Discovery of Skills, which extends its discriminability to learn skills with discriminable dynamics. And more recently, Archit has actually applied this method 
to a real world robotic locomotion task. So what you're seeing here are two robots that are optimizing for discriminability of the dynamics of their skills directly in the real world. Uh, after about two and a half hours of training, they can kind of waddle a little bit in different directions. And uh, after considerably more training, they can consistently make progress in different directions uh, in the room. Uh, the two robots are just used for efficiency to basically paralyze it. So after 18 hours, we have to switch down to one robot because uh, it starts running out of space with two of them in there. And it can walk pretty consistently in different directions. Once these skills are, are learned, we can actually combine them to solve more complex tasks. So what you'll see next is these skills learned with unsupervised reinforcement learning being repurposed in a kind of hierarchical reinforcement learning scheme to reach the uh, box here, the yellow and green box. So this is actually triggering multiple skills in sequence to minimize distance between the robot and the box. So here the robot basically learned to walk without any supervision during training. All right, now let's talk a little bit about unsupervised meta-RL. To provide some motivation for this, when we started off talking about this, the basic recipe was to pick some task and improve with respect to that task during pre-training, and at test time, somebody selects the task. But what if the user doesn't actually select the task directly? What if they select a reward function, and then we have to explore and maximize that reward? This is the setting that we actually talked about in the beginning. And we talked about how this is basically an exploration problem, which means that pi and p of t need to somehow learn to learn. We can actually formalize this as a meta-learning problem and use the ideas in unsupervised RL to derive a family of un unsupervised meta-RL methods. First, let me give you a quick primer on meta-reinforcement learning. In regular RL, we want to learn some policy that maps states to actions. We generate some trials from our agent. For example, if this quadrupedal robot is trying to learn to walk to the right, we generate some trials and then update the policy based on the gradient of its reward. If we're doing meta-reinforcement learning, then we have many different tasks. And what we want to optimize is not the performance of the policy in all of these tasks, but rather how quickly each of these tasks can be learned. So we're going to be training a function f, which is an adaptation function. f takes as input the MDP for the task i, denoted here with mi, adapts to that MDP, and that produces a policy. So f is a mapping for MDPs to policies. And our goal is to train f such that the reward of the policy outputted by f on MDP mi for reward ri is maximized. We can write this out as the following equation. Maximize with respect to f, the expected value under the distribution over MDPs m, of the expected value under the policy pi prime m, of the MDPs reward rm, where pi prime m is the result of applying f to m. Now, in practice, the way that this might work is that f could be a big recurrent neural network that performs multiple trials in the environment and then adapts, or it could be something like a pre-trained neural network that adapts by gradient descent. So f might denote the weights of a big RNN, or it might denote the initial parameters of a policy. We're largely agnostic to how the meta-learner actually works. The point is that it's maximizing this objective, maximize the performance of the policy after adapting to that MDP. And typically, we'd like to adapt to the MDP as quickly as possible, meaning in as few trials as possible. Now, meta-reinforcement learning is a very powerful framework for adapting to new tasks quickly, but it has some pretty major problems. See, meta-learning requires us to have a task distribution. So if we're given many diverse tasks, then we can learn to adapt to new tasks quickly. For example, model agnostic meta-learning, or MAML, can learn walking in different directions from training on, on different direction walking very efficiently. So after MAML training, we get a policy that sort of walks in place, but after just one iteration with a reward function to walk to the right, the ant can immediately learn to run, run to the right. However, when there are too few meta-training tasks, we can meta-overfit, and specifying task distributions is hard, especially for meta-RL. So if we meta-overfit, then we might not do so well on new tasks at test time. If we can propose tasks automatically with unsupervised reinforcement learning, then meta-reinforcement learning can be much more powerful because it won't hinge on this very hand-engineered choice uh, of designing these meta-training tasks. The basic recipe for an unsupervised meta-reinforcement learning algorithm could look like this. We're given an environment, basically an MDP without a reward function, and then we perform some unsupervised task acquisition. This is basically unsupervised RL. And we use those unsupervised task proposals, those P of Ts, to perform meta-training, to learn the adaptation function F. So if we have latent tasks, we can say that our reward is going to be R of S comma Z, just like before. 
And then our meta RL is maximizing the expectation under Z of the expected value under the adaptive policy of R of S comma Z. And then once we've meta trained F, then the user might select a new task and we'll adapt to it. In practice, we're going to use model agnostic meta learning or MAML, but many other meta RL methods can be used also. The task will be proposed using the same kind of mutual information objective, because as we discussed before, these mutual information objectives can be shown to be optimal or at least bounds on the optimal performance in terms of minimizing worst case regret for arbitrary test time tasks. The main difference from before is that our goal is not to learn a policy that can perform any task. Our goal is to learn an adaptation procedure that can, that can quickly learn new tasks from rewards. So the policies that we talked about before were conditioned on goals or on Z's. They could achieve new goals or uh, reach particular Z's at test time, but they didn't by themselves have a way to adapt to new tasks from rewards. The meta-trained adaptation function F will be able to adapt from rewards. So how do we choose, how do we do optimal unsupervised meta RL? Well, the main theoretical result that was shown in this paper by Abhishek Gupta, uh, uh, Benjamin Eisenbach, and Chelsea Finn is that we can propose tasks by maximizing mutual information trajectories and then meta train F on this task distribution. And if we do this, then we minimize the worst case regret in the face of the worst reward adversary at test time, where the re regret is given by the difference between the expected reward of the optimal policy and the number of trials that we need to adapt. In practice, we would actually use Diane, uh, which is the state mutual information proposal method from before, which maximizes mutual information between states and Z's, because as I discussed previously, mutual information between trajectories and, and Z's is actually quite pessimistic. Here's an evaluation of this method on a 2D goal navigation task, a task where the half cheetah needs to run forward and backward, and a task where the ant needs to walk to different locations. Crucially, during meta training, no hand specified tasks were provided, and the test time tasks are based on tasks used in prior work on fully supervised meta RL. The green line shows the unsupervised method with optimal task proposals, the red line shows what we get from training from scratch, and the blue line shows random task proposals. What you can see here is that the optimal task proposals tend to do the best or as well as the best, but actually even random task proposals can do very well in some of these cases, indicating that unsupervised meta RL is potentially a very promising framework for acquiring powerful adaptation strategies. All right, the last topic I'm gonna to talk about today uh, will challenge some of the uh, assumptions and statements that I made previously and discuss how we can take a different look at unsupervised reinforcement learning algorithms that maybe might be a better fit for some realistic environments. So, so far, all the unsupervised RL methods we discussed are really predicated on this notion that we should seek out diversity or coverage. For example, when I talked about skewfit, I discussed how we identify unusual states and upweight them. In fact, whenever we maximize mutual information between something like states and tasks, a big part of that is to maximize the entropy of those states, basically cover as many possible things as possible. The conventional wisdom is that unsupervised RL is essentially fundamentally related to intrinsic motivation, which is a kind of novelty-seeking procedure that aims for broad coverage. And this, appear, this idea appears in many prior works, both works in exploration and intrinsic motivation and curiosity and many others. But is this actually a good way to do unsupervised reinforcement learning in realistic environments? Or are we perhaps being led astray a little bit by the particular design that appears in most of our reinforcement learning environments? So typical reinforcement learning tasks like the half cheetah are structured in such a way that basically nothing happens in these tasks unless the agent executes a concerted and goal-directed pattern of action. So if the cheetah wiggles its legs randomly, it's not really going to go anywhere and nothing unusual will happen. But the real world is actually pretty different from this. For the actual cheetah, if it sits around doing nothing, uh, it's not actually going going to stay in a kind of a stable, steady equilibrium. If it just sits around doing nothing, it might starve or other animals might come and chase it. Basically, weird and surprising things will happen to the actual cheetah, even if it doesn't do anything particularly intelligent. Agents in realistic environments do, perhaps don't need to seek out surprise because surprising things will happen on their own. And maybe the real challenge in these settings is actually maintaining a homeostasis. So I'm going to talk about some work, uh, primarily led by Glenn Barsat, Daniel Gang, and Colleen Devon, that tries to build on this idea to devise a very different way to look at unsupervised reinforcement learning. The idea is that we're going to aim to maximize homeostasis. 
avoid weird and unusual situations. You have an agent, and that agent has some beliefs, which we're going to note as P theta of S. Much like the goal proposal from before, these beliefs are basically ba learned by fitting the states you've seen so far. So if this agent is playing Tetris and it's seen lots of empty Tetris boards, maybe its beliefs will assign high probability to empty Tetris boards and low probability to Tetris boards with very complex and weird block combinations. The world will produce a state, and the agent will adjust its beliefs to maximize the log likelihood of all the states seen so far. So it's basically trying to fit its beliefs to all the states that it's seen. And then it will take an action. And its goal in taking that action will be to maximize its total sum of future rewards, where the reward of the next step is given by the log probability of the next state under its current beliefs. Now, crucially, this is reinforcement learning. So the objective is a long horizon objective. It's trying to maximize the reward over all time. And critically, it knows that it can maximize its reward both by changing the state, visiting states that already have high belief, and also by changing its beliefs. So if it visits some very unusual states, maybe the reward will be low at first, but then it knows that its beliefs will change. It'll accustom itself to those states and get higher rewards. And this is very, very important because this encourages the agent to do things that are a little bit unusual in order to enter a better homeostasis later. For example, if you imagine a robot that's outdoors, in the rain, in the sun, seeing all sorts of different weird things, if that robot goes and builds a house, initially it will experience a lot of surprise because it's never seen houses before. When it's inside that house in a more stable environment, in the long run, it'll actually see more consistent states and therefore achieve higher rewards. So this encourages the agent to do intelligent and complex things to enter a better homeostasis. And this leads to some interesting emergent behavior. For example, such an agent can learn to play Tetris without any rewards at all. So here you're seeing the actual surprise minimizing agent playing Tetris without receiving any rewards except for this surprise minimization. Here we put the agent in uh, the VisDoom hold the line benchmark where there are enemies in the distance that throw fireballs and these other enemies that uh, approach the agent. When the fireballs hit the screen, that creates a very surprising observation. And when those uh, worm things get close, that also creates a surprising observation. So without any supervision, the agent actually learns to uh, shoot the fireballs and shoot the enemies. Here's a continuous control example. Here, this humanoid robot is placed at the edge of a cliff and given a little push. And it learns automatically to stabilize itself and resist getting pushed because when it falls off the cliff, it experiences lots of very surprising states. And of course, these results are reflected quantitatively. So the agent actually does better at playing Tetris and playing this VisDoom game as compared to an agent that tries to minimize, that tries to uh, maximize uh, entropy. So the real challenge of these environments is maintaining homeostasis. And we might say that the environments were somewhat cherry picked, but I would actually argue that the properties of these environments better reflect what we expect to see in the real world. Because in the real world, surprising things do happen on their own. The second law of thermodynamics tells us that entropy increases over time. So perhaps the real challenge in more realistic settings is maintaining homeostasis, and perhaps trying to meet this challenge can be a more effective unsupervised reinforced learning objective. So I talked about how we can derive an objective for unsupervised RL. I talked about how we can derive practical deep RL algorithms for this, extend them to the meta-learning setting, and then how maybe we can take a different look at unsupervised RL based on minimizing rather than maximizing entropy. So the takeaways from the talk that I'd like to leave you with. First, reinforcement learning from rewards likely doesn't explain everything. It certainly doesn't explain how humans learn. And the basic idea of unsupervised learning, which has served us so well in, in uh, conventional supervised domains, could perhaps be very effective in reinforcement learning also. We can formalize unsupervised reinforcement learning as a regret minimization problem, which can motivate a mutual information objective. We can instantiate it uh, in the form of practical unsupervised deep RL methods, both for goal reaching and for learning arbitrary tasks. And we can even instantiate as unsupervised meta RL algorithms that can learn to learn new tasks quickly without any hand specified meta training tasks. And lastly, maybe we should uh, think carefully about what the underlying assumptions for these methods are, the degree to which they apply in the real world, and whether a better framework might actually be more effective in the future. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the students that were involved in this work and I'd be happy to take questions during the question period following this talk.